Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Benjamin Simon, music director of the San Francisco Chamber Orchestra. Ben has recorded as principal violist for MCA Classics, Vox, CRI, and Laurel Records, and was awarded the Grand Prix de Disc in 1991 with the New World String Quartet. Ben is formerly director of Berkeley's Crowden School of Music, has taught at Harvard, Stanford, and UC Berkeley, and is also music director of the Palo Alto Chamber Orchestra. Ben has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us, and I'd like to thank you, Ben, for joining us today. Thank you. So let's talk about the chamber orchestra in contrast to the symphonic orchestra. Talk about how orchestras are shaped and the purposes for which they are shaped, and the place of, of the repertoire in the chamber uh, uh, concept. A chamber orchestra is sort of halfway towards a chamber music ensemble, which is an unconducted ensemble, uh, best known like a string quartet, right. two violins, a viola, and cello. So we're somewhere, we're like a hybrid. The chamber orchestra rehearses and performs like chamber music, and that's really what I love about a chamber orchestra. It's a, it's a smaller, much more tightly knit, closely, uh, closely communicating ensemble, but it's not this enormous symphony orchestra with seas of violinists and and woodwinds and trombones going off into the, into the far distance. Is the interaction between the audience and the members of the, of the orchestra uh, different? We hope so. And that's an experience the San Francisco Chamber Orchestra is trying to bring, the sort of an immediacy and a closeness. Uh, we don't play in enormous halls. I mean, Herbst Theater is, is a large hall, but we like audiences to get up closer to the music. And you know, you're not watching through your opera glasses from the last row of Davies Hall. And, you're closer and you can see the musicians. And because we're a smaller orchestra, there's an engagement by the players. Everybody counts. You're not the 12th stand second violins, which even in a great orchestra, you can lose some interest as you, as you go hundreds of yards from a conductor. So we stay close, we're small. We try to get the audience to know who our players are. So there's really a connection, a personal connection there. In the creation of the art, do the players also have a different role? than in the, in, in the larger uh, setting. Absolutely, it's much more engaging for the players, we hope, because there are four violinists on a part or maybe six violinists on a part instead of 20 violins on a part. So everyone counts, everyone's engaged, and I tend to hire players who give me that edge of the seat engagement. I don't want those, I don't <laughs> want the people just dial, dialing it in. So do, do you end up having uh, more um, uh, uh, discussions in terms of how a performance is going to unfold and, and the type of contribution that each player makes in order to create this whole? Because when you have a bigger proportional impact and when your, your sound is more isolated, um, what you do affects the whole in a much more palpable way uh, but it also is a, is a time when you can actually show your stuff. That's actually true. Um, my job as a conductor is to run the rehearsals and make sure we're not wasting any time. A string quartet is where everybody has an equal voice in a saying and in a way you, that you're presenting a piece of music and you can go into endless discussions. So it's very, very democratic but also semi-anarchic. Open-ended, anarchic, it's a wonderful way to make music but, it, but it's not very time efficient. And my job as a conductor, I hire these musicians for only a certain number of rehearsals, we have a certain number of hours. So I do ask for input and certain of my key players will give me more input perhaps than others. And there, there is a protocol. I mean, you're not supposed to be interrupting the rehearsal and when orchestra members will suggest a different way of playing it, I, will, I won't say absolutely not, I'm not like, I'm trying not to be autocratic about it, which really a conductor of a large symphony orchestra has to be. So I'm trying to create an atmosphere in the orchestra where people have their voice. So it's, it's more like playing chamber music for them. What is the repertoire that you... Oh, there's a fantastic repertoire, fantastic repertoire. Not only can we do all, everything Baroque, um, which means, you know, up through Bach and Handel, up through the middle of the um, 18th century. And then, of course, classical music was written for chamber music, for chamber orchestra, Haydn, Mozart, early Beethoven. Um, and uh, as Beethoven was, was one of the key con composers who developed the orchestra. So when you start with Beethoven, it's just a couple of woodwind players. By the time you get to his Ninth Symphony, <laughs> he's, he's, it's trombones he's and all trumpets, over the place. He's all, and right. a chorus, he's right. all over the it's, place. Do you tip, dip your toe in uh, to the contemporary world? Well, absolutely. The neoclassical movement right. 
of the, of the early 20th century, led by Stravinsky, was writing for smaller and smaller forces. They were, some of the composers were getting tired of what they felt was a bloated orchestra, the orchestra of Wagner. Big sound. And Bruckner and Mahler. Big, huge orchestras, big sound, big long pieces. And some people like Stravinsky sort of chopped it back up and put you know, really small ensembles back on the stage. Um, Dumbarton and Oaks Concerto, the Symphony in C. I mean, these are these are wonderful pieces for smaller orchestra, and I just eat them alive. I, <laughs> this is this is repertoire I love, and of course, in the last twenty or thirty years, there are lots of composers who are writing for smaller or smaller forces than the symphonic orchestra. Who are your audiences? Because in in today's culture, where you have uh, contemporary is is a lot of things, yes. but I, I don't think it would be uh, it would. When you say to people, when you say to a young person attending high school, um, attending college, working, what do you listen to? Well, there are large numbers of people who really do love what we call classical music. You know, despite the marginalization we can talk about that in today's society where really classical music is not anywhere in the public eye. It isn't, and, and the classical music stations are all going away? They're going away. When, when I was growing up, Leonard Bernstein was putting the New York Philharmonic on- On TV? Prime time TV, right. can you imagine? Yeah. We're starting to wake up to the fact that we have shot ourselves in the foot, if not the heart, in presenting classical music in fancy auditoriums and big ticket prices, um, and people think they need to know something. There's been an elitist air Although the San Francisco Symphony, the Metropolitan Opera, uh, the various opera companies around, around the, the country are increasingly trying to popularize and to make accessible yes. these performances yes. through their, their, um, their broadcast into movie theaters and so on. That's correct. That's right. And I think, I think we all have to do more. But what the San Francisco Chamber Orchestra has done that um, many organizations have not dared to do yet is we've removed admission prices. So the, ma the major stumbling block of you can't come to a concert because you can't afford it or you don't want to pay is gone. Your entertainment dollar is gone. Um, and this is a model that's actually worked very well for us because um, we are drawing people who might be, have been turned off by classical music or don't think they might like classical music. And so we're drawing them into the concert hall. There's no reason why they can't go to the concert hall now. Right. Because we're playing in all these communities around the Bay Area. We're making it free. And, but, and on top of that, we're trying to make it accessible. We're trying to make it a friendlier, more audience-friendly, uh, a happier concert experience than just sitting in the back of your chair and, and taking a nap for three hours. So are you the audience development um, uh, institution for the classic classical music? Well, that's an interesting way of putting it. I won't say we're the anything, or one of the, one but of those. we're trying some very innovative things to, to rebuild interest for classical music in people who have really had no experience towards classical music. And we do, you were asking about modern music, we do contemporary music, and we have a very active commissioning program. We, um, for our small number of concerts, we do a lot. We had two world premieres last year, and we have active commissioning programs, and we usually choose young composers from around the Bay Area, which is part of a larger educational mission that the orchestra has. So when you, when you commission, are you funding those commissions? Yes, we are. We're funding them, and also we apply for foundation funding for commissions. So how do you keep your, your uh, financial ship uh, righted and, and, and not somehow capsize? Well, it's, it's a challenge, but it's, as it is a challenge for all you know, nonprofit organizations right now. Um, our model is give, give out of your own feelings of generosity and support for the orchestra, not because we're beating you over the head with it. So we give you the concerts. We, ha we hope that you will like what you're hearing and either give us something on the way out. We have a membership program that's, that's growing. And our members now support about, about a third of our budget which is actually more than most ticket sales will do for other organizations. A third of your budget. A third of our budget comes from members, and we want to be a grassroots organization, so our membership start at $50, which is for an entire season of programs. Of course, you can come free, but our concerts are selling out, if you could say selling out for a right. free concert. But um, we're, tu we're turning people away at venues almost everywhere we play now because people like what they're hearing, they like our style, 
They like the quality of the music. We're interesting programs. And we're attracting new people. So if you're a member, you get a reserved seat in the hall. If you're not a member, you have to wait till the members come in, and then you get to sit around the edges. And we're hoping to convince people that way. That it's really not, while these concerts are free of charge, they're not free of cost. In that way, you are encouraging a people to join, to, to actually um, make an investment in the next performance so that they get seats. That's correct. And we're also hoping that by being a member, that it's a deeper relationship with the orchestra than just buying tickets. Because as a member, you get invited to receptions and parties and meetings with the composers, and we have onstage events. We're trying to engage our audience in a deeper way through the membership and keep them, keep them involved, keep them interested. And then at the end of a performance, did, did, did I misunderstand? Do you actually say that if you want to contribute yes. to, the, to today, tonight's performance? So you're doing a try before you buy exactly. a kind of, a kind of a, right. uh, an, an approach. It's almost a pay on your way out model. I mean, we don't require people to pay, but we're hoping that you'll enjoy the concert. And people come up to me and go, I had no idea, you know, a, a free, one of the issues is free in this society means not high quality, right. right? We learn that you get what you pay for, and if one ticket is $15 and one ticket's free, well, of course, what you're going to pay for the $15 is going to be better. So we're trying to turn that on its head. It's a difficult to convince people of that, but once people come into the concert and we do everything we can to get them there, they're kind of going, wow. Well, aren't you taking a, a, a cue from what is happening on the internet right well, now, where people can use apps and, and try them out for, for 10 or 15 or 20 days, um, or even forever, and then volunteer to actually make a donation? Well, it's interesting you said that, because one of the problems with selling tickets these days to anything is so much is free on the internet. Right. You, know, you can listen to absolutely any piece of music you want to on YouTube. Of course, that's not the same experience as going to a concert. And this is something we're also trying to tell young people. You have not heard classical music until you've heard it live. There is a qualitative difference. And you don't have to pay for it. Come hear us. Come hear us live. Hear a French horn live instead of through these teeny little earbuds, which sound really bad with classical music. And bringing young families in where um, very often uh, financial means, uh, so you don't want to take a risk. You don't want to, particularly you don't want to go into an unfamiliar place where you're going to be spending 50, 60, 70 dollars a ticket, let alone for, for, for your family. Exactly. Um, and, That's right. and then you deprive your, your children of, of the, those experiences. You've removed those barriers. Now, you've also mentioned that um, we do concerts specifically for young families, for families and young kids. We have our main stage concert series, and then we have family concerts. So we bring admission-free, family-friendly, you know, 45-minute presentations with a magic show or with young artists and with a ballet company, with singers, and we try to make these very engaging as well as educational for families. Now, there are people who would say that, that doing a magic show and before a concert Oh, no. Is, or, or during a concert. What, what do you do? We, magic and music, we will tie it together. Ah. So we have magicians, or we have a, we've worked with a circus, the Circus Bella, and we're uh -huh. doing a program with Circus Bella, and they are very musical. So we'll explore musical themes with juggling or with dancing, or we'll, we'll always have some kind of educational or programmatic theme. So you don't mind being a bit subversive in how you oh, introduce... Oh, we want to be as subversive as possible. <laughs> we're trying to have fun with our concert. That's another thing that classical music audiences have been lacking. They just, it's not, it's good for you. You know, right. it's, it's good it, for you. Take your vitamins. Exactly. And, and, you know, so many people aren't, you know, the younger people particularly say, I don't need to do that. I can get all my entertainment online or I'm watching the videos, but... We're trying to show them that a live, high-quality classical music experience doesn't have to be expensive, doesn't have to be boring, can be very interesting, fun, engaging, and that's really our mission. In terms of, of your musicians, um, how do they feel about, about this approach? Um, are they contributors to the ideas? Are they uh, coming in to do their job and, and uh, going home, um, how do they interact with you organizationally? Not not on stage, because you've already de described that, but uh, as part of, of 
the, the orchestra itself? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, we are not an orchestra-run collective. Mm -hmm. There are some groups, particularly in Europe, is doing this. I think they're very successful, and they're coming up with lots of great ideas about how to, how to present music, how to market music. We're doing this with a small committee. We do have some musicians who are on our artistic advisory committee, but right now we're, we're pretty small orchestra. The musicians, we're not a full-time job for anybody. Our musicians are teaching and they're playing in other orchestras, and they're playing in chamber music groups. I'm actually very proud of the number of string quartet players, either present or ex-quartet players. I was, I'm an ex-quartet player myself that we really, we, we foster an attitude of, cha of chamber music and of participation. So I think my musicians, not speaking for everybody, but really enjoy the several weeks a year they spend with the, with the San Francisco Chamber Orchestra. We have a great time in rehearsals. Um, and everyone's saying, you know, we want you to grow, we want to do more of this. So we, we're, we're have, we have big plans for the future. Let's talk about those plans. We've been growing since 2002 uh, when I, inherited the orchestra from their previous music director and founder, Edgar Braun. And even despite the trying economic climates, uh, you know, we, you know, everyone is kind of going up and down right now. We are actually, have been growing our orchestra each season. We're trying to expand back to four, concert, four main stage concerts a year. From three. From three. And we have our family concert series. We have a series of concerts for young kids, toddlers, at the Crowden School in Berkeley called Very First Concert. So we're expanding our uh, offerings, both for adults and for children, though I have to say a lot of grown-ups come without kids to our family concerts, and I really like that. So kids of all ages, and they're getting musical concepts on a little more basic level. They're getting things explained to them, to them that they might not at one of our main stage concerts. Mm. And uh, we're building our board of directors. It's very exciting. Um, we have a new director of operations for the orchestra. We have a new fundraising consultant. I mean, it's all, a lot of things people don't see when they go to the concert. And we're building, there's this whole underground organization, obviously. And you see the symphony hall and the opera, and you know there are people back there working, you know, 40 to 80 hours a week, keeping those orchestras alive and organizations growing. And we're very small, but we're doing the same thing. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Ben, thank you so much for sharing your experience it's with us. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, Mark. And thank you for your insights.